So they find Jay. J. Robin Amahar is a peace activist. Let's see, he's self-taught, he speaks seven languages, including Latin by the time he's 12. <laughs> I mean, he's a genius. Where does, wow. they have a summer home in this really beautiful, beautiful place that he just adores. He rides his horse as a young boy. He goes camping. That's the kind of stuff I did when I was a kid around here in Ogden, in New Mexico. They find him. They don't ask him to run the Manhattan Project. They tell him. They got unsimilar mind. He says, I refuse to do it. You know, it was going to be run out of Los Angeles, rocket dying, the whole nightmare there. No. He tells them no. Well, you have a summer home. You love it so much in New Mexico. What if we bring it there and set it up? That's why it's set up. That's the only reason it's set up in New Mexico. Still won't do it. They brought it to him anyway. The early nuclear physicist says he would take them on horseback rides, freaking for three or four days in the woods, and these are a bunch of softball scientist sissies. Oh, they couldn't hang. <laughs> so, this is important stuff on Chernobyl. So all these nuclear physicists, they developed the bomb, of course. So you can look up Jeff Bezos' father. I want you to Google Jeff Bezos' real father. Jeff Bezos' real father, nuclear physicist at Los Alamos, who was charged with statutory rape of a 14-year-old girl. The guy got convicted of it. They won't really tell you who the real nuclear physicist is, but look up Fermé and Bezos. You tell me. Fermé died in La Jolla too, young. So Fermé, when they, they built Trinity, they made Trinity, unflumped some money. The Enola Gazin went over Utah. They're going crazy out there. They're testing it. You know, Tippett's is out there. They're all out there. Oak Ridge, Tennessee. You know, the money's just flowing. Mm -hmm. So when they drop Trinity, they all bet. Fermé bet one dollar, this is the sick bastard that he was, that it would kill everyone in New Mexico. Oh, they dropped it anyway. Oppenheimer. Well, there's a good chance it'll suck all the atmosphere out of the earth and kill the whole earth. I don't think we should do it. <laughs> they did it anyway. So, they're all set up. The war's over. Y'all to buy the sea. The war is over. You know. Why did they kill Hirohito? Hirohito was a lot. He's the emperor, the Bataan Death March. He's the guy. So, they're going to drop these bombs. As controversial as you get, Einstein's a gas, says no. Oppenheimer says, drop a test bomb. Let's drop a test bomb over the ocean, over the top of the ocean. This is long before the Bikini Atoll. Let's scare them. The war's over anyway. They're done. Well, the Cold War's gone. So, they drop not one, but they drop two with the intentions of dropping three. Oppenheimer's aghast. The whole world's aghast. I'll quote Jedgar Hoover, who was supposed to be the biggest neoconservative of the time, which would be a raven lunatic, liberal by today's standards. He says, never in the history of mankind have they indiscretionally freaking mass murdered civilians in the history of war. This is the sickest, and the United States will regret they ever did it. The United States is evil, blah, blah, blah. We're done. We're over. He goes crazy. They all go crazy. They all back out. They find one guy named Edward Teller. Edward Teller is the linchpin to this thing. So Edward Teller hasn't been dead that long. So I still say Chernobyl, and this is not conspiracy. Don't take me in with conspiracy. I still say Edward Teller blew Chernobyl. And it's, that's not a very, you know, that's not that radical of a thought. You know, there's plenty of the guys in that circle that think the same thing, including Teller himself. Teller ran this whole nuclear mad show, for, including nuking my father in the Nevada test. They, they nuked their own Marines. Edward Teller made those things. Einstein was a hardcore peace activist by now. Always was. So was Oppenheimer. Oh, what they do to Oppenheimer? They label him as a communist. He backed out. So, but Teller was the good dumb puppet. Livermore, the suicide rate there. By the way, I saw in the obituaries today, a young woman here, in Utah committed suicide, and she's born and raised at Livermore. So I'm sure parents, if you've ever been to Livermore, California, it's all the nuclear monsters. That's all they do there. So, Chernobyl, Chernobyl, Chernobyl. The arms race was born. You know, we know our bomb by the bomb, pop, 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 pop. Well, it was also going in nuclear reactors and nuclear energy. So, Teller at the end of his life said, well, you're probably responsible for poisoning the earth, killing millions, if not billions, if not trillions of living things for time and all eternity. He says, I don't care as long as I stop them Prussians. He, you know, Budapest, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, that's where they're all from. You know, that fight's been going on for centuries between the 
Russians and the Hungarians and the Austrians, the royal family and bread. So it was supposedly a man-made deal on Chernobyl. Now there's rumors that the guy was suicidal, blah, blah, but it was a human error that caused Chernobyl. And then people say, oh, well, we couldn't project a tsunami of Fukushima. Really? <laughs> what? Tsunamis in Japan. Huh. Tsunamis in California. Earthquakes? What? The Ring of Fire? It's insanity. So, it blows. Igor goes in with his friend with the helicopter. They take pictures. So, none of the pictures turned out because the radiation ruined all the pictures. It's old school. This isn't like now. You don't have a freaking digital then. You know, he's in his way. One picture. One picture survived. One. And the one picture survived changed the world. Just like when the KSL reporter, AP reporter, climbed out to Dugway here in Utah on his hands and knees in 1968 and said there's dead go shoots out there, there's a nerve gas leak, and took that famous photograph of all the sheep. Same thing. Journalists with balls and a producer that had the guts to put it up. That's how he shut down San Onofre. I snuck in there, me and some other people that worked there leaked it to me, and we got it to a television program, and they had the balls to put it on the news in Cal Southern California. That was the end of San Onofre. But we have none of that. They've circled the wagons on it because they're a bunch of weakling coward professors, weakling cowards with their golden handcuffs that just, you know, tote the company line. That's what media is. So let's get back to the narrative on Chernobyl quickly and Fukushima. Now this is this simple. I read this to you. Chernobyl. One partial meltdown. It was not fully fueled. One blew up. Partial. It was not a full meltdown, it was a partial meltdown. Blew up. One. Now, can you do kids, now, Orwell, you know, Winston, have you ever seen 1984? Have you ever seen 1984? Two plus two is still two. You know, that's Orwell. This is Orwell and stuff. So, okay, let's go real simple, kids. What's bigger than one? Is two bigger than one? Is two more than one? Two's twice as many as one. What about three? Is three bigger than one, kids? Three's three times one, right? That means there's three of them. What about four? So Fukushima, Japan, they covered it up. It took me a year and a half to convince them there was only one. There were four full blown out meltdowns. Four. And if you don't believe me, watch 60 Minutes with Lake Barrett, who I know personally, who told me, you know, third party. Well, somebody asked him in the early days, well, Kevin Blanche is saying these are meltdowns, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he says, well, Kevin Blanche is right. Will you go on camera and say that? No. He says, well, that's not what you said on RT. That's not what you said on CBS. That's not what you said. He said, well, Kevin Blanche is right, but what are we supposed to tell these people? What are we supposed to do? We had to make up something. That's Lake Barrett. That's who's running the cleanup, who ran the cleanup at Three Mile Island, who's running it at Fukushima, Japan, who was on 60 Minutes recently. I will quote him. This has never happened before. Leslie Stahl's a gas. Where's it at? Right there in the ocean. So one partial meltdown at Chernobyl with 780,000 men who entombed it. Did we entomb Fukushima? No. Did we intend to? Yes. 32 ships were sent in immediately. I read the transcript from inside the station where it leaked to me again. Now, I could talk about this now without going to prison because John Holden's done an interview. I'm the girl, guy that put the girl up to the interview. Make it so. So, they sent 32 ships into entomb Fukushima, including the USS Reagan Operation Friendship. Lawsuit pending in San Diego. I've been heavily involved with that. Why did they not? Inside the Situation Room, Barack Obama... John Holden, CEO of Floor Construction, CEO of Chicago Bridge and Iron, CEO of Je Jeff Rommel, John Holden, backed them out. Why? To protect the nuclear industry. So they made the decision to pump, dump water onto it and push it into the Pacific Ocean Why they tried to get a handle on it. They never got a handle on it. I was in front of the White House in November of 2013. The reports came out that they got rid of Secretary Chu, who was head of the, you know, the cover-up, you know, Gregory Jacko, that I know him personally. I mean, I can go on and on and on, all these criminals, the cover-up. They retooled. They got Ernest Moxie Fuel from MIT, the new secretary. He was in Fukushima. What? TEPCO executive has been called to the White House. We stood right in front of the White House and watched him go in. We have video, you know. So they retooled the cover-up. They did not have a handle on it. 
They tried to use nanotechnology. John Holdren convinced them, head of the science and technology, who wrote his PhD on eugenics, not conspiracy. Look it up. John Holdren, eugenics. MIT, excuse me, Cal Berkeley. Milk study covered up. All covered, They went into cover up mode. That's all they did. They classified the word Fukushima in 2013. I know this for a fact because I worked closely with Senator Wyden, who was head of the committee, who went to Fukushima four times, five times. I worked closely with Barbara Boxer's office. She was head of the committee. Allison McFarland, head of the NRC, who threw Barbara Boxer's with subpoena power out of the NRC's office. You look it up. None of this is conspiracy. It's right in front of God and everybody to see, which I reported in real time. So you tell me. You're trying to tell me that Chernobyl's that catastrophic, which it was. So let's think about this. One partial reactor that melted down for how many days? What, 79? It was reactor 7. Right? Yeah, but they entombed it after, what, 70-something days? Yes. We've got three full-blown-out meltdowns, not to mention spent fuel pools full of MOX fuel that cracked on impact, leaked, caught fire, and blew up. Video proof. In front of God and everybody to see, because we have a live cam out in the sea. That's activists had that live cam, or they would have covered this up. You saw it blow up. They lied. Arnie Gunderson, right on my side, I had to throw it to him, he's a hydrogen bomb. You know, I got cancer shortly thereafter. <laughs> what a story. So, you tell me. It's, it's really simple. One partial meltdown at Chernobyl, because it's still uninhabitable. Nightmare from hell. Three full blown out core meltdowns being pushed into the Pacific Ocean with fresh water dumped onto it every day, pushed into the ocean for 3,000 days. At least four spent fuel pools and Unit 3 plumb full of MOX fuel from Savannah River, George, the Revit plant, in there. Hundreds of thousands of tons blown up to smithereens into the atmosphere. Plume flying over the United States for six days. Obama and gang flown out of the country. Now, again, not conspiracy. Look it up. He gave a press conference talking about, he says, I want you to know what I do on St. Patrick's Day 2011. I want you to know what I know. The plume has not hit here yesterday. We're not expecting high levels of California yet. We are going to keep you posted. Gene McCarthy, head of RADNET, the radiation detection aid, in fact, on, uh, uh, you can look it up, took down RADNET, crashed it immediately. Then they went in and they raised the legal limits four separate times. Thousands of times, and, and, a bomb, and Trump's even worse. He's done the same thing. No legal limits now. And so, okay, one partial meltdown, three full blown out meltdowns, blown up, and the jet stream moves over. So you tell me which one's worse. I mean, do you really have to be a nuclear physicist? So, you know, and we'll stop there, and then let's talk about Devoto. I want to get back to Devoto and Bernard Devoto, because we don't talk enough about him. Bernard DeVoto, born January 11th in the late 1800s on Monroe Boulevard in Ogden, Utah, in the height of the great boom city and its infamacy, the great Orpheum Theater, the great railroad boom, the Broom Hotel, in the shadows of these, this incredible boom town. Bernard DeVoto wrote across the wide Missouri. Bernard DeVoto wrote uh, the decision 1846. Six, I mean, his, the great historian. Probably the most important male writer in this country since Mark Twain. By the way, Mark Twain's publicist. We used to have the Bernard Devoted Debating Society right here at Weber State University. He's very controversial. He was an incredible... The environmentalists used to call themselves conservationists then. Yes. He was an incredible conservationist. He was Freudian, and I want to say this. Fama K. Brody, of course, the other Freudian, the, great, the greatest female writer since Harriet Beecher Stowe in this country, bar none, historians. They're Ogdens, just like me, Ogden boy. But I didn't have time to write a book, and I didn't have a publicist. So Devoto grew up in Ogden. So it is, blows my mind, his incredible legacy, his books, and if anybody ever read any of his books, oh, my God. What a genius. What controversy. But... What a historian. This is important. Bernard DeVoto and Fama K. Brody were writers second. They were historians first. He wrote the centennial. He wrote the real story. He countered. Arrington was found by the Mormon church. And Arrington wrote the great Basin Empire. DeVoto countered it with his own history. The... I don't know if it's called the Utah Empire or something Empire, but 
What's what's that book called? His <coughs> Devoto. Which book? The one about when he countered, not the decision. That's a great historical book. Across the wide Missouri, which you've got right here, Cole. Yeah. You got in the library. Open it up and show the artwork. Open a few pages now. He he worked with the famous artist, the Western artist Miller. Yeah, there's some like some beautiful landscape. And art. so this book is written about here, and it's a romantic tale. Now that's based on Fort Benefit in Ogden. There was a fort there before that, the Jim Bridger. Devoto, I mean, this history was alive and well. Devoto was a little boy. He watched it unfold. The fur, hell, the fur traders were still here when I was a kid. So, the book's about one of the trappers marrying one of the Shoshone, the Chief Cherokee, who was buried on my land, our land's property. He, you know, he was murdered right here in Ogden. He married his daughter, which that, that's exactly what Jim Bridger did. Jim Bridger married, so it's really a romantic tale based on Bridger, Jedediah Smith. So there's a movie made out of it. So Devoto really railed on Ogden. He went, but this is, Devoto railed on everyone. Devoto's style was hardcore. He was bra Freudian, Freudian, Freudian. Fama K. Brody, Freudian, Freudian. Fama K. Brody wrote Jefferson's biography. Now remember, Fama K. Brody. When you say Freudian, what, is that? what do you mean by that? Well, it, that's a literary style. It's an art style. So f Freud. Freud, yeah. Heard of that before. Well, Freud's the famous psychiatrist in Austria yeah. who broke everything down. And what Freudian means in literature is all it means is they're raw. They're like Michelangelo. No panty painting, no cover-up. They just really tell it just exactly, no matter how harsh it is. You know, people misconstrue that with sexuality. Freud said that everything came down to the orgasm, the, you know, the, you know, he, he broke it all the way down in the in the brain psychologically hmm. and so you know he got down to the purity which by the way in Vienna with Trotsky with all of them but anyway so that's what we term in art and literature as a writer who holds no bars just tell they don't care just tell it the way it is don't matter how I mean when Kerouac talks about being raped by the marine hunting that's Freudian when Fama K. Brody says hey uh, what was her line about Joseph Smith the only line I, I cannot believe the Mormons got violated she said he was a Improvisational genius. genius. Yeah. Was he? I would say. Oh, yeah. Probably, probably the greatest of all time. I mean, the, the whole religion sounds like it was like improv, like just on the spot. You think? <laughs> so he, that's exactly what, but she went in historically. Now remember, Fawn Brimhall. Brimhall, Fawn Brimhall was her mother. President Brimhall of the Mormon Church, which there's lots of Brimhalls in here in Utah, Klaus Cindy, you know, the playmate, you know, who we all know. There's lots of the, uh, how about, how about this Brimhall? Lauren Scott? Luann? Mick Jagger's girlfriend who hung oh, herself? Yeah, you were saying She's a Brimhall from here. I grew up with her. So, Fawn Brimhall, the great counterculture that she was, was Fawn's mother. That, she's the daughter of the president of the Mormon church. On both sides, then, of course, the McKays. So Fawn was the historian. All she did was lay out, she got Mormon records, and she was a researcher. Bitch, she was a hard work historian. That's what good historians do. We do research, right? She just basically broke down that we were taught that Joseph Smith had four wives. No, he didn't. He had 47. Mm -hmm. And she gave names, addresses. 47. Yeah, and she's the one that exposed that in the book. And the book's historical. That book's not her, you know, if you want to read something that's like that, don't read that book. That book's historical. It's a great historical reference. The it's, one by Fawn McKay? Yeah, No Man Knows My History. It's a no historical Man reference. History. It's history, history. She's, Fawn McKay Brody was a history professor. The youngest history professor, she was a girl, female? She, she wasn't even a woman yet. She was a girl at Weber State at like 16. Mm -hmm. Professor she, at 16? Yeah. Yes. Where at? What, at what university? Weber State, but... Yep. Could that have... Could yeah. something like that happen today? Oh. No, nope. I don't think so. I mean, they're students, you know, but... Yeah, but 16, that's... Think about that. Super young. So young. Well, somebody super found young. her at Weber High School, the famous old Weber High they told down on 12th Street. They found her, and somebody wrote a who's who. It was another... It was an English... It was an English or a history uh, teacher found her and wrote her a who's who, and he's like, oh, my God, she's an incredible genius, and he believed in her. She was, That's, like a, she was like a historian already at yeah. age 16? Yeah. 
Well, she got raised by that mother, her spawn. What a radical. I mean, whoa. I mean, she was going against the Mormon lies in earnest, and she knew them firsthand. She lived them. And so yeah. all she did was go in and lay it out, which the Mormon church agrees with it all. I knew Fawn. I remember the day she died. And she was friends with the Devota. Devoto grew up in this. This is, Devoto was recording history out of his own mind. If you grow up in Ogden, Utah, and you have an observational mind like, just like I did, watching this, in this incredible city, how can you not be Freudian? I was Freudian long before I even knew who Devoto was. And then I'm like, well, he grew up the same place. Well, hello. If you knew what I know about this city, oh, this incredible, incredible. By the way, if you get a chance, walk outside. If you live in Utah today, this afternoon, the sun's finally come out. we got these heavy, heavy, heavy May snows. And you take a look up at the mighty Ben Lomond in Mount Ogden. It will take your breath away. The heavy snow up there on the green, green. We don't ever get to see that. I mean, it is stunning. And I mean stunning. And so... Oh, yeah. We Washed grew. Right now. Oh, beautiful. I mean, cold but beautiful. You know. yeah. But yeah, a little cold. So Devoto, yeah. he, Fawn not only taught here, she became the first female history dean in the history of the United States. Don't you think that's enough for a statue here? Why are they blackballing her? Why are they blackballing me? Why are they blackballing Bernard Devoto? It, it's insane. Go talk to a, you know, there's a couple history professors that grew up here that, I mean, Dr. Burroughs did his PhD on it because he's so overwhelmed. And these are, you ought to hear him go off. He's worse than me about what, how pathetic this English department is. Come on. We're talking the two greatest writers. I think it's unarguable. Fama K. Brody is the greatest writer. I mean, Jefferson's biography, you want to read a beautiful, incredible, I mean, that's got to be one of my favorite books. Fama K. Brody wrote that. How about Nixon's biography? Fama K. Brody wrote that book. I mean, just those books alone. Forget No Man Knows My History, which is a historical, one of the greatest historical freaking manuscripts in the history of humanity. How about Bernard DeVoto across the White Missouri? And then how about all his historical work? The decision of 1860, uh, yeah. of 1846. And so he's an Ogden guy. We used to celebrate these guys around this town. Why the hell don't we now? Go ask a literature professor who he is. They'll say, who, what? What, he's from Ogden? So, Devoto, he's at the University of Utah. He ends up at Harvard. By the way, ended up being the dean of Harvard. And by the way, so who's the biggest publicist's house? Mark Twain's publicist, the biggest publicist in the world is Harper, right? So Mark Harper's Mark Twain's publicist. Mark Twain went snap when he was, he's living on 10th Street in Chelsea in Manhattan. Mark Twain snapped at the end of his life after his wife died. And he went on these tyrants. Well, Harper owned all his work. Harper invented him. You know, you know what, how Mark Twain's named? I do not. So Clem is his real name. So he worked on a, he worked on a steamboat on the, Mississippi, and that, they're called Twains, where the outlets and the guy on the ship's got a the guy out front has to mark the Twains. There's a Twain right there, so they don't reckon. Oh, mark Twain. He was a Twain marker. Mark the Twains. That's what he did for a living. He was a Twain marker. His brother was killed on the boat. Wow. Anyway, and then he goes to the Comstock. Blah 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 blah. San Francisco. So he gets a newspaper writing like the Signpost, and he. San Francisco. Uh, yeah, he he. That's where he merged from. He oh, was just. He, he went there and got a got little. Him teeny job with some emerging uh, newspaper, and he wrote about the Comstock, which again, Utah, Mike Lines. The Comstock? What's that? That's the silver rush in Reno, after uh, the gold rush. Yeah. And so, that's where he came from. So, he wrote these rants at the end of his life, Twain. But, by the way, Twain was an oligarch propped up. I mean, I love his wit. I love his work, even though he was invented. You know, he was fed what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. Like, it's very similar to today. What do you say that? It's a fact. You know, it? So, Wait, like, for, for instance, do you know about, uh, what's his name, the African-American kid that got so famous about 10 years ago writing? What was his name from North Carolina? Hmm. And then it, it got, exp Ryder? yeah, he got famous here. 
you know, it all got exposed that he was completely propped up by Philip Morris 100%, and he was invented. That's what they do. That's what corporations do. They've always done it. The publishing houses have always done it. You want to get something published? So, like, ghost writers or something? Like well, that's what they all are. It's all invented. I mean, it there's has someone, been. There's someone writing all this. Now, the only people that have ever broke through that dynamic in the history of mankind are Harriet Beecher Stowe broke through. Well, how did Harriet Beecher Stowe break through in the 1850s and 60s? Or 50s, 30s? Let's see, who was Harriet Beecher Stowe? Do you know who her dad was? <laughs> Plantation multi-billionaire, one of the richest men in the world. And she says, Daddy, how can you sit and say you're God and go to church when you're taking that infant from that child's hand? She would read scripture to him. She broke ranks. So they wouldn't touch her. She published her own book. What, what is her name? Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Oh. So Uncle Tom's Cabin, I will quote, Abraham Lincoln, he called her the White House. He says, so you're the little lady who started the Civil War. Tell me that literature doesn't change the world. She did it on her own. She went rogue. How so, old was she when she wrote that? She was young. I'm not sure, but she was young. And her sister, too. They... Wow. Have you read that book? Oh, Uncle Tom's Cabin? Oh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's a no, masterpiece. Are you it kidding? Is, I never read it. Ah, watch the movie. What Here we are. It? Does it just go into, like... It's about Slavery, the, the right? time, the time. So what it's about, war, right? so Uncle Tom, that's why, remember what we talk about when uh, Rick Mahorn called Carmelo and Uncle Tom? Yeah, Uncle Tom. Do you know what the Uncle Tom in the African community means? They used to call him house and N-words. Yeah, like, So Uncle Tom, so the slaves were in the field, whatever, the ones they liked and would go along with them and be their friends, they put him in the house. Uncle Tom was the house servant. So Uncle yeah. Tom thought he was playing along. Now, it's not Uncle Tom's fault. Well, you would do whatever you could do in that situation. Yeah, to get out of but what happened is the, the slave owner, the oligarch who liked him, he treated him good, died. So they sold him. The new slave owner didn't like him so good. He beat him to death. And so that's the term Uncle Tom. Harry Beecher Stowe wrote that masterpiece which broke the back of slavery. I mean, it was already in going because, you know, Tom Brown, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole other dissertation, but... So, Fawn, how did Fawn get traction to write that book? Let's see, David O. McKay, the McKays, the Brimhalls, they thought she was the Mormon historian. Oh, this young protege, genius from Weber High School. She's the bloodlines of President Brimhall. She's the bloodlines they didn't know that Fawn was coaching her mama, and mama had gone rogue. And so they were propping her up. Nobody had ever read the book. Oh, look at this great book that in Ketter Protégé that we have, Mormon girl, Fawn McKay Brody wrote, none of them bothered reading the book. Oh, they had no idea what, what the book was about. Oh, no. So they promoted the book. The book was going crazy through the Mormon circles. And you got to realize the Mormon thesis in newspapers around the country was the number one controversial subject matter. I mean, these guys that declared this own place, their own country, called Deseret. You don't think this was mainstream media all over the world every day, Mormonism? Oh, people were looking at this going, what the hell? They have how many wives? Or how young? They got their own country? What? The whole world was, I mean, it was the number one headline story for decades all over the world, was Mormonism. Wow. So.